What are we starting with we this week? Oh, for goodness sake. Without <laughs> interrupting me, time. what are we starting with? We review. This? Without interrupting me, what are we starting with? A we review. This? A nice we review. Oh, my Lord. Okay, yes, you're right, champ. Thank so, you. So, this one says, favorite podcast, five stars. Amazing podcast, really interesting and funny. If you want a fun game, take a shot every time Corey says effectively. Now, look, listen to me. Everyone watching, <laughs> I need you to know that I say effectively for a good reason. Effectively, basically, all of those words are because scientists can't say anything I'd be a hundred percent sure. There's always this tiny little, this tiny. Because if you percentage. say something with like one hundred percent certainty, and then someone goes, "Well, not all the time." Yeah, like makes it, you look like an idiot. Exactly. If it? I say pigs cannot fly, mm. categorically, pigs cannot fly. Do you know what they're going to find out about tomorrow? A flying pig. Just the one. It's going to happen. I promise you. Okay, it's it's going to happen. So that's why you can play that game. Shall we start the show? Let's start the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp and Luke Cutworth. Cutworth. Hello. Well, hello there. This week, we're talking about a dick and a flu. Uh, oh. 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 Yeah. Is it is it someone called Richard? Yeah, it is. Ah. <laughs> Has it got something to do with the flu? It does have something to do with the flu. Okay, uh, so, I decoded that on Sherlock Holmes. Well done. I, I'm very proud of you. So, <laughs> Thank you. So we're talking about uh, the Spanish flu a little bit today. I say we're talking about the Spanish flu. This is not the Spanish flu episode. There will be a Spanish flu episode, but that is not this one. This one is about a man named Richard E. Shope. Richard Ellis Shope, mm. who discovered something very interesting about the flu. But we'll get to that mm. in a bit. What do you guys know about the Spanish flu? It was about 100 it, years ago, yep. and it killed mm. a lot of people. Yep. It's basically... Okay, right... Everyone listening. And it didn't and start watching. in Spain. I know that. That's true. Yeah, it didn't yeah. start in Spain. So everyone listening um, and watching, just picture your picture your you know your life today. Now take away all of the technology that you've got. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've done that, just imagine that you've just come out of a big world war. Okay. Mm. The first. That is yeah the first. Yeah. That is exactly what was happening in 1918. That was the Spanish flu. So it was just. Like the pandemic we're going through right now. Yeah. But take away all the fun stuff about it. Yeah. yeah. Not the fun stuff of it. There's nothing. Fun. Well, actually, it's actually, as in like the coping mechanism, like the Netflix, the distractions, the chill. Yeah. The chill, yeah, yeah no Netflix, no chill. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's that was a big issue uh, back then, the Spanish flu, and it's much the same as what. What was? Sorry, I took the technology away and I couldn't hear you for about a minute. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm just saying that the Spanish flu was a big pandemic that happened about a hundred years ago, and. You know, we say it, I'm saying it's as bad as today, but actually it was, uh, it seems it was quite a bit worse. But let's talk a little bit about what the flu is. What is the flu? A virus. A virus, yeah. Yeah. Influenza. What? That's right, dead yeah. right. So the influenza virus or the flu, it's a virus that attacks your respiratory system, which is what? Your lungs and all to, everything to do with breathing. Yeah, the air. breathing stuff. That's yeah. right. So it's very contagious. If an infected person coughs or sneezes or talks, uh, all the little droplets from your breath, from your lungs, uh, will just come out and go into the air. Oh, I'm sure it's all sounding very familiar to everyone. Um, <laughs> and then if someone else inhales it, then they got the flu. Not necessarily, but you know, oh. they've got a chance of getting the flu. Uh, and this is just this isn't the Spanish flu, by the way. I'm talking broadly about the flu because there are lots of different flu viruses, mm. as you are probably aware. There are many, many, many flu That's viruses. That's why we In have fact, to get jabbed yeah, every year, right? Exactly, because yeah. they they're highly variable. They they change. A lot. It's like a constant arms race, us against the flu. Mm. So some flu symptoms, if you guys haven't already had them, and if you haven't, very lucky you, uh, they can come on very quickly. Um, you get a sudden high temperature of 38 degrees or above. 30 degrees Celsius, by the way. Fahrenheit, right. you'd be dead. Um, I, uh, frozen yeah. to death, hypothermia, right? Wait, no, hold on. What? Where's the point where Fahrenheit and uh, Celsius meet? Uh, yes, they meet at 40 Okay. Ooh. Well, yeah. So I don't think you'd be too dead at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, that's not the point. Hang so on. You got Is, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Negative 40. Oh. Negative okay. 40. So you would be very dead at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know because I don't uh. use it. So you've got a temperature of 30 degrees C or above, an aching body, feeling tired or exhausted, much like listening to this podcast, a dry cough, <laughs> sore throat, headache, difficulty sleeping, loss of appetite diarrhea or tummy pain, Ooh. feeling sick and being sick. And then children also get the same symptoms, uh, but they can also apparently get a pain in the ear and just be a bit less, you know, active, you know, just lethargic. Pain in the ear. I used to get that a bit. 
Maybe you had the flu. Maybe. Well, kids get ear infections a lot, actually. I'm actually, sure it was why. probably an ear infection. I'll have to look into that. I also had a pool. Apparently, they're really common when you have a pool. Yeah, if you've got a pool, you just get all that ugh, sitting yeah. in there. So, how does the flu work? It's, uh, as I said, a respiratory, a respiratory illness. It's called by, caused by the influenza virus. Um, and it's not the same as a cold. It's got similar symptoms, but it's not the same thing as a cold. Although some people might think that. Both are caused by viruses, though. Um, but the cold is caused by a lot of different kinds of viruses uh, than the flu. Um, and it's also a lot milder. Uh, it's unlikely that you're going to die from a cold, but people die from the flu. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, the flu kills a lot of people every year. Like, uh, it's very, very many. I think, like, thousands in America per year. Tens of thousands. It even. sounded like a Donald Trump speech. The flu kills very many, many people. It kills in the America. most amount of people, many, actually. Many, many people. <laughs> thousands, in fact, in America, the only place that exists. <laughs> many dead die. But it doesn't in kill America. as many people as the radical left. <laughs> Antifa, Antifa, Antifa kills Black more Black Lives than the flu. Matter. The flu, as I said, can be quite deadly if you're susceptible to it, which most people. Or not, although it's a good idea to get a, a flu vaccination. Actually, this is something I've seen recently. Uh, people being like, the only time I got the flu is when I got the flu vaccine. Oh, there, yeah. can be, there can be complications to getting the flu vaccine. Um, just because you got the flu when you got the flu vaccine doesn't mean that everyone gets the flu when you get the flu vaccine. Otherwise, we wouldn't be giving people the flu vaccine mm. because they'd be getting the flu. Bear in mind, when you get a vaccine, it's uh, either a mild... We went over this in our vaccines episode, which was... Uh, last year at this point yeah um you know when you get the when you get the vaccine um it could be a weakened form it could be a dead thing but sometimes it can still cause sort of mild form of the illness so and aren't a lot of the vaccines like 50 percent effective a lot of the time i'm i don't know necessarily about that but yeah no i think that um ultimately if you get the flu after getting a flu vaccine that does not mean you should stop getting the flu vaccine because um it's it's still quite effective yeah uh so like I said, colds are less likely to be, uh, you know, quite serious. But uh, when the flu gets into your body, basically, we've spoken about how viruses work before. You guys know how viruses work. Why don't you guys tell me how viruses work? Oh, yeah, I would love to. Luke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, the virus goes into your body and then it finds whatever cell it wants to attack. Uh, and yeah. it injects a little bit of DNA into that cell, which causes the cell to make more copies of that virus. And then that back that cell explodes, and all those viruses go off and do the same thing to loads of other cells. I'm so glad really on the same quite page. Mean. It's a, well, it's not that mean. It's just nature, isn't it? Yeah. Is it mean for a lion to eat a gazelle? It's pretty. Is mean. it mean for a gazelle to eat a blade of grass? Is it mean for a blade of grass to grow? Yes. To eat the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yum, yum. <laughs> yum yum. But they literally <laughs> are eating. I mean, the sun is going to die anyway. But they are literally eating the sun. It's like yeah. if um, it's like if you had little parasites that ate your. Oh, they do. So it was but like, if you run time backwards, the grass is making the sun. <laughs> so, have you ever considered that? <laughs> Thank you, grass, for the glorious sun. <laughs> the the grass is making part of the sun. Yes, a very a very flowers, small part. And the flowers making the rest. That's so. No, lovely, the, the grass Thank is making you. a very small part of the sun, <laughs> like a minuscule yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, but no, um, I mean, if you think about it, actually. Uh, we do also have little tiny things eating our dead skin. <laughs> so they're basically like, they're grass and we are the sun to them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and if you turn time backwards, those little dust mites, they're, eat they're making you. They're making us. <laughs> oh, that's so kind. Little dust mite daddy. They're, they're making us so that we can grow <laughs> ever smaller and then shoot back inside our mothers. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Who they also made. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird family tree. It's more like family roots, isn't it? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why, like, yeah, that, that's basically how viruses work. Uh, so, um, when the flu virus... <laughs> Not that whole thing. That whole thing. That's how viruses work. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there are there are points where I remember the convers like so I say the conversation. There are points where I remember the comments that we get that are like, "You guys don't talk about enough science," you know. And I'm like, "Yeah, we don't talk about enough." Science. <laughs> if you've that's come why here, we're in the comedy section on Spotify. That is why we're in the comedy section on Spotify. 84th. The top eighty four. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Well done, everyone listening for doing that. Not everyone listening, actually, just the ones listening on Spotify. Everyone else. Ugh, where would we fist. be if we talked about more science? Yeah. Not 84th. No, no. We Well, actually, we don't know. 
we'd have we'd to do a in test the education on it. category. <laughs> That's <laughs> where we'd be. <laughs> Probably be like third. <laughs> 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 the funniest education podcast on the planet. <laughs> um, so, uh, back to the science for once. So, uh, when the influenza virus gets into your body, for how long, really? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Here's another drinking game, by the way. If you listen to the the, the opening stinger, uh, drink every single time we go off topic. Just take a uh. shot. <laughs> <laughs> but also make sure, <laughs> make sure you're you know. Uh, at a hospital because you will need to be they yeah. will have to st- pump your stomach you also need an entire bottle of whatever spirit you choose oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's just for the first 30 minutes yes <laughs> I like how you said back to the science and I successfully derailed that plan within about 5 seconds <laughs> take another <laughs> shot <laughs> <laughs> so actually back to the science when the flu virus gets into the body it goes to the respiratory tract uh, and once, once it's there it, like Luke says it finds the cells it just shoots its uh, genetic information, the RNA, into the cells. Uh, and then the cells make, you know, um, they basically make the virus, which then uh, bursts out and it just moves to other cells in your lungs and your respiratory tract and Forever. just keeps on doing that. And that's why you get really ill. Well, I say that's why you get really ill. You also get, like, some of the symptoms are your body trying to fight it mm. because your respiratory tissues, your respiratory tissues, that's such a hard thing to say. Why don't we all try and say it once? <laughs> your respiratory tissues. Your respiratory tissues. Your respiratory tissues. Your respiratory tissues. I'm really your sorry respiratory tissues. to the person that is captioning this. <laughs> <laughs> your respiratory tissues. Your respiratory tissues. I, honestly, of all, like, I feel sorry for all the, like, for one, the people that listen to this thinking, oh man, I'm going to get a good science podcast. Two, for the people that, like, for the people that caption this, uh, that have to, like, just type us saying I'm random another crap. shot. We're going to get an angry email. <laughs> so, the respiratory tissues uh, swell up uh, and get inflamed, uh, and the virus st- then uh, starts to try to move into the bloodstream, and that's when you start to get symptoms. Mm. Um, and then that continues, the virus continues to replicate for a bit. And then uh, usually uh, the body's immune system will uh, start to fight off the virus or you'll die. Um, those are your two options. Either mm. you fight it or you die. I Just don't want to say that because now I'm, see, this is the thing. Now I'm, now I'm saying that I'm thinking there could be some third option that I'm not yet aware of. Yeah, I mean, that kind of is it, isn't it? Because we don't have, do we have any treatments? Do we have antiviral drugs? Yeah, we got we antivirals, but yeah. not, I mean, I don't think I don't know if we got them for the flu. Right. Off the top of my head, someone yeah. is going to be like, "Actually, well, you should know that we've got the antivirals." For no, I, I was I was safe, looking at the NHS. We could um, say essentially, there are two options. Yeah, yeah, essentially, essentially. Yeah, the real word I should be yeah. saying is the other one, but I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> no, the NHS uh, do recommend for the flu. Uh, uh, actually, there are four FDA-approved antiviral drugs for the flu this season. Good for them. Uh, but you'll probably you'll probably not get those unless you're, you know, on the dying end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the NHS generally just uh, uh, suggests for most people that have got the flu, just stay in bed and drink lots of water. Try not to be dead. That's what the that's the one ad- piece of advice you always get from the NHS. Try not to be dead. Um, so it's the aim, isn't it? <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> they should just change it to the not de- the NDS not dead <laughs> service. Um, so. Yeah, and and obviously, uh, when you've got the flu, you could die of other things. You could die of pneumonia or uh, other things that the like other complications that the flu can bring on. Because bear in mind, your immune system is going to be quite low because you're fighting off this virus. So you could be infected by something else mm. that then causes you to um, kick the bucket. Uh, and bear in mind that this is just generally sort of general flu. This is sort of seasonal flu. I'm not talking here about Spanish flu, swine flu, bird flu whatever flu you want to talk about this is just seasonal flu that, that happens sort of every year mm-hmm. so now you've got a basis for how the flu works don't yes you? yeah you yeah. feel you can understand it yeah the, when you nod they can't hear you yes <laughs> <laughs> almost, you happy almost two unless years. it's some very <laughs> aggressive nodding <laughs> i don't think they'll hear it <laughs> did you hear that Time will only tell. The Spanish flu. Why is it called the Spanish flu? Um, Didn't America just want to blame it on Spain? No, maybe. America well, would never want to blame it on anyone. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you don't see America blaming the China virus on anyone, do you? Okay. <laughs> that would be preposterous. I couldn't get through that. I couldn't get through. <laughs> if you call it the China virus, stop watching. We don't need you. Um, 
No. So, um, it it's called Spanish flu, and this is from History.com. So I I don't know how biased this source is. I don't know how much they. I was going to say whitewash, but I guess the Spanish are white. How much they whatever wash uh, history. Uh, so Spain was one of the earliest countries where it was kind of identified. Uh, but then also uh, some historians think that it could be because they just didn't have as much censorship in Spain. Mm. Because if you want a little bit of history, because this is the history boys, the history guys, not the history boys, that's a film. This is the history guys now. Uh, in World War I, Spain were neutral. They didn't want to fight. So they didn't have as much censorship in the media because obviously if you're in a war, you don't want the newspapers being like, this is happening and that is happening because your enemies can use that information mm. to take you down. Uh, so the Spanish newspapers clearly were reporting on it more than other places. Um, and then it, it could be that other places were having it, other places were having it uh, before Spain, but it just wasn't reported um, quite as well. And also right. back in the early 1900s, uh, which is when this was happening, by the way, like 1918, uh, sort of time, uh, reporting wasn't very good. Like medical reporting was just like bad. They didn't keep good records. Mm. Uh, it's, they just they just weren't very good at it. So we don't have a, a huge. We've got like you know a fair amount of records, but uh, we don't think we're, we've got complete records on it. Essentially, what happened here is Spain uh, was one of the first places to report it, and most other people were probably keeping it close to their chest. Haha. <laughs> um, and so it kind of got called the Spanish flu, uh, and then it just stuck even though there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that it started in Spain. Right. Yeah. Do we know bit where it started? It's of an own goal for Spain, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. What, what do you mean it's a bit of an own goal? They didn't do anything wrong. No, no, of course. I understand that. I just mean, I had always like sort of labored under the illusion that basically the Spanish flu was called the Spanish flu because someone wanted to blame it on Spain or it was like, m like misdirection or um, I don't know, something like that. Whereas actually... The Spanish flu being called the Spanish flu was was because Spain reported on the Spanish flu they were and other places didn't. Yeah, and I think that's just so interesting. It's not there's no like oh country band like countries fighting or blaming each other or scapegoating or anything like that. It's just yeah, such because they were the most honest. Well, no, it kind of being is, honest. It kind of <laughs> is countries blaming each other because all the the other countries that might have known about it that would like like let's say America had like you know knew about the Spanish flu they were like. Oh man, shit. we got this. We got this flu. We got this big old flu happening. We don't know what's going on. Oh, Spain just said they've got a flu. Spanish flu. Ha ha ha. Spanish. It's like um, it's like the gay kid in school, right? That's in the closet, that bullies the gay kid, that is out of the closet in school. That's exactly what's going ah, on. Here. Hey. Yeah, I love that, that Netflix trip. <laughs> is it always um? <laughs> yeah, I, but but America and Spain didn't get together in the end, unfortunately. Yeah. As as it should happen in Netflix shows. Yeah, look, is it also something potentially to do with the fact that there wasn't sort of, um, other than in national newspapers, there wasn't so much kind of inter, like there's no internet, there's no like scientists, like a way that scientists or doctors across an entire country can, can communicate. And so like, if you're just reading in the newspaper that, oh, Spain's got a big flu, or that you're reading in a Spanish newspaper, like a national newspaper, we've got this flu. And you're kind of seeing the flu, but your national newspapers aren't talking about it. As a doctor, you might conclude, oh, that came from Spain. Yeah. Like, cause I, I mean, think we can't, we can never understand what it, what it must have been like to live in a country where the only centralization of information came through like government organizations or, or like or the news, military yeah. or like that kind of thing. Whereas we now just tweet something and anyone from anywhere else that's can true. see it. Yeah. And that, that's, you know, that's really interesting what you say, because that is what the, the internet was kind of initially conceived as a way for sort of professionals yeah. and scientists to share information. And now it's become a place where we do this podcast and make memes, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> still, uh, it, it still serves that initial purpose. And yeah, I think, um, I think it is interesting how, well, how similar, uh, the pandemic then is to the pandemic now, but also, uh, the fact that they had much you know, a more primitive technology than us. Mm. They they mm. didn't have uh they didn't have any sort of way of uh, communicating in nearly the same way that we do, and and yeah, and I genuinely think that uh that really affected it. Although I was reading that apparently um I might actually have this in my notes, but I was reading that uh it, it could have been um the virus could have actually started with uh Chinese immigrants and workers. Uh, I say workers. I don't know how free they were. Um. Mm. 
uh, not so hot on my history, but it doesn't seem very good uh, because they were, I think they were moving from Canada and around and then to like somewhere in Europe. Um, and they initially, I think there were reports of uh, these Chinese workers initially having a virus or not having a virus, initially having sort of symptoms um, of, uh, you know, of, of the virus and uh, then sort of moving around. And then I think it was the Canadians that were like, oh, well, it's just the lazy Chinese, isn't it? It's those lazy Chinese oh, workers, that, that racist trope that we have now. Um, so I think like the, the sort of symptoms of the flu that they had were just being written off as, oh, it's just, just those lazy Chinese workers. Ha 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 ha. Um, and that was ignored. And I think they then went to Spain and spread around Spain. So I think actually it, it, it may have originated either in China or with these Chinese workers that then spread it around um, in, to mm. different places. But it was ignored because um, racism. Yes. God, you gotta love it, don't you? Racism. Making the world a much worse place. It always gets here when you most expect it. <laughs> Unless you're white, in which case, <laughs> when you least expect well, it. Well, never. And never. I, I, racism? <laughs> what? I thought that was over when Rosa Parks sat on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wasn't. You know, okay. I brush on my history. You guys like to hear uh, a fact that uh, will destroy your worldview forever. In fact, yes, anyone listening to this podcast, I give you um, the absolute sort of permission to stop listening from this point onwards and just take some time to yourself. <laughs> Rosa Parks could have seen the first Shrek movie. What? Was she alive? Or could she, she was alive. Rosa Parks. Uh, there, there is, there is no evidence to suggest that Rosa Parks could not have seen the first. Uh, I think even two Shrek movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. It also it. gives did, you a real did span Park of understanding of when racism was still like what, Rosa still Parks. Yeah, yeah. Now, Rosa Parks. Like, have, yeah. When that part of of history was happening. Yeah. Bloody hell. The first two Shrek movies, Shrek One and Shrek Two. What? And do you know the I beautiful hope she thing? did. They, she deserves to see them. Exactly. And the beautiful they yeah. deserve to be seen by Rosa Parks, I think. Especially Shrek yeah. and the, Honestly, the beautiful part about this is that Rosa Parks um did not have to see Shrek, the Shrek 3 and movies. 4. <laughs> what no? Shrek 1 and 2 are fantastic movies. Shrek <laughs> Shrek 1 it, it twists it, it twists the genre. Shrek 2 builds upon it. The best sequel of all time, one could say. Then Shrek 3, disappointing, but I still like it. And Shrek 4. Don't even work. Don't even call it a Shrek movie. It breaks the forum. I've too forgotten much. what it is. Shall Corey, we get back to the science? Again. You're doing it again. What? <laughs> Not getting back to the science. <laughs> look, it, this podcast is predominantly. Look, okay, right. I'm going to come no, clean. No, don't go into no, another no, digression. No, 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 no. Just get back to the no, science. <laughs> no, I'm going to come clean. This is a really short one. I'm going to come clean, okay? This podcast. The reason, the reason that I wanted to start it was not to talk about science. It was actually just to talk about things that I want to talk about. It just turns out that a lot of the time I want to talk about science. That's why we go on so many tangents. It was all one big lead up to talking about Rosa Parks and Shrek. Why isn't it just called The Guys? That's sexist. The Guys! No, because The Guys describes every podcast that exists ever. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Two white guys and that's it. Two white guys and some microphones. <laughs> Or two white guys that think they're funnier than they are. And Corey. Oh. <laughs> so back to the Spanish flu. Uh, as, I, as we've said, we don't actually know the uh, exact origins of it. We think that it might have had something to do with uh, China and racism. Mm. But um, again, I think this is a bit murky. So you know, don't take my word on it. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the symptoms of the Spanish flu. <laughs> Why are you laughing at the symptoms of the Spanish flu, Corey? <laughs> That's really <laughs> uncomfortable. The symptoms of the Spanish flu. Uh, initial symptoms are, you know, similar to other flu symptoms. Sore head, uh, tiredness. Then you get a dry, hacking cough. Lose your appetite. Ew. Start having problems with your stomach. Uh, that's a polite way of saying uh, diarrhea. Uh, and then... Um, afterwards you start sweating excessively like uh just a lot um and then after that it starts hitting your respiratory organs so your lungs it's like oh no we got pneumonia bro um and then uh <laughs> and then um it's that's the thing uh this is often the main cause of death pneumonia and, mm -hmm. and other complications and this is one of the things that uh that actually uh people have been talking about with the current pandemic where they say oh um Actually, have you noticed that uh, even deaths that aren't exactly due to the virus are being labeled as deaths from the virus? That's ridiculous. That's not true. I just want to go, run you guys through this. When someone dies, uh, they have a death 
little death sheet that they fill. A doctor mm -hmm. fills out a little death sheet to say what happened. Mm -hmm. There are like four different. So you've got like uh, the way it works is basically this led to this led to this led to this. Yeah. So you've got like a primary thing and then like what actually literally killed them. Mm -hmm. So like if what actually killed them was like let's say I don't know I, like I'm not a doctor so I'm not gonna do this like properly. <laughs> if what actually killed them was like oh their lungs exploded. Then mm. you you go back through to see why their lungs exploded. Oh, their they their lungs exploded because they ate dynamite and also yes. a match. I don't know, but you know what I mean. Like, uh, the exact literal cause of death might have been brought on by other things. So that's why that's I think the same happens for uh for some cancer deaths. So if someone dies uh from cancer, uh, they may not actually die from cancer so much as they mm. could die from pneumonia. But mm. the reason that the pneumonia killed them is because their immune system was lower because of yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and and that's the thing. If you're immunocompromised, uh, like you know, the flu could be very deadly for you, uh, and anyone could be immunocompromised. So you know, um, it's like when we talk about the flu, sort of um, killing some people, not killing others. It's people that are immunocompromised or very old or or other sort of things like that that are susceptible to that. So that's that's the sort of symptoms of it uh of the spanish flu uh but the that was the first wave uh so there were two like sort of two waves uh the second wave was uh very very infectious like very contagious um and people started dying within sort of hours or days of getting symptoms uh, which is like a proper plague uh, and their sort of their skin would turn blue and their lungs would start filling with fluid and they'd suffocate um and just because of this uh, within a year, um, within that year, the average life expectancy in America just like dropped by twelve years. Whoa! Because Whoa. so many people were dying. Yeah, yeah. Twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah. Which is ugh, not good. But yeah, so this is the thing as well. I was thinking about this um, while I was doing this. People didn't necessarily know exactly what was causing this. Like they knew about bacteria back then, and I think they knew about viruses as well. But mm. they couldn't figure out what was causing this and th that's where the sort of um what i'm going to talk about later comes in but can you just imagine sort of like I'm, i think it's really lucky that we live now where the coronavirus happened and as soon as we sort of knew what was happening we already knew that it was a virus uh, a coronavirus mm. um and like we we knew so much about it already like we were already like ready from the get-go mm -hmm. whereas if you go back like uh about just a hundred just about 100 years 100 what, 102 years mm -hmm. they spend uh they spend quite some time trying to figure out exactly what it is. You go back even uh, sort of even farther, you've got all the different plagues and things where people genuinely just had no idea. Like people were dropping dead and people were like, you know, they had people in the sort of plague doctor masks uh, filled with sort of nice smelling things, mm. um, having canes so that they didn't have to touch people because they had no idea what was causing this. They thought it could be bad smells. They thought, be, thought it could be a lot of different things. So they were just mm. like, when they were coming up with the plague doctor stuff, um, they, they're, it, it was literally made to look scary to ward to ward off things that uh, like I think it might have been spirits or things because they were like well what if it's this or what if um like disease are carried by bad smells all of these different things they were like we got to cobble together everything to oh just goodness. Mm, like potentially defend against it whereas nowadays we're like oh we know what is causing it and we can very quickly get to the root of the problem mm -hmm. like we know that masks help we knew that's basically straight away and we were able to contain it well, um, if governments did their job properly, we'd be able to contain it um, very quickly and very well. Uh, but yeah, okay. So that's that's those are the symptoms. So I wanted to go through some stats and like you know tell you a little bit about the Spanish flu because again, as I said, this is not the full Spanish flu episode. Mm -hmm. It's just a little taster about the Spanish flu. Just a little <laughs> a teaser, a sample. <laughs> How many people roughly? Um, uh, like what rough sort of percentage of the world population do you think died from the Spanish flu? Percentage. Yeah, uh, or a fraction. I'm going to get uh, something ridiculously high. I'm going to say 15%. 15? Yeah. Mm, Luke? I was going to say about 10. Oh, man. Is it higher? One of you's got to double it, and I want you to decide which one it is. 20. 30. About one third of the, of the world's population. Um, got, what? Wait, did I say died or infected? I think you said you died. You said died. I meant infected. Okay. Okay, How that's many still died? quite shocking. Uh, okay, so let me read through this. So uh, about 50 million worldwide um over half a million of that was in the was in the US uh but we think it could be more than 50 million because like i said we we didn't keep good records mm -hmm. back then so it 
I can't believe I said one third of the world died from no, one third of the world <laughs> were infected by that. So I was like, I've, bit, seen, I've definitely seen graphs of world population over time and none of them suddenly dropped, dropped by a third. By <laughs> <laughs> do you know what not even in the wars. <laughs> What's really funny is that like do you ever like say things and you say one thing and just completely think you've said another? <laughs> Yes. Like I did not register that that's what I'd said. Um yeah, so it uh one third of the world we think uh got the virus and uh I think maybe about well three percent of the world we think died. Which is a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. Uh and it could be more because again, they weren't counting them properly. Um now mortality was really high uh in people that were younger than five, um, and also from twenty to forty years old. Uh, that's us, and also sixty-five years and older. So, if you're 6 to 19, or 41 to 64, you're good. You guys are great. Everyone else? <laughs> oh, no, dear. No. Off you go. <laughs> good lord. Um, <laughs> and th th this is the thing. It, there was a really high mortality in people that were healthy, um, which is worrying. Because, mm. you know, you if, if all the sort of people who are already healthy um, are getting very, very ill... Uh, yeah. And then also the people who are already not very healthy are getting ill, but not necessarily uh, having a huge mortality rate. You've got hospitals being completely overrun. Mm -hmm. So apparently uh, more soldiers, American soldiers, died from the flu than were killed in the war. That's ridiculous. Yeah, right? It's a lot. It's a lot of people. Bear in mind, this is World War I. Um, and like quite, quite so many people died in World War I. Yeah. Um, apparently 40% of the Navy was hit uh, got the flu, um, the US Navy, and apparently 36% of the army got it as well. Um, and obviously they were moving around the world mm -hmm. in like very crowded conditions. So they were perfect little incubation, like mm. perfect little incubation bags for the flu. Um, so um, like I said, people, people say that it's uh, roughly like 20 to 50 million potentially people died. Uh, but we like we some estimates go as high as 100 million. Yeah, because uh, uh -huh. we just don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but there also, another awful thing about this, is that there weren't very many places that were immune to it. Uh, pretty much everywhere got hit by this, this, this Spanish flu. Like, it was a, mm. a, a, a global pandemic. And I say global pandemic because um, some people uh, may not know this. Pandemic uh, generally means um, either a sort of global epidemic, but it could also mean an epidemic... Uh, of a specific country. So when you hear people say global pandemic, that's why. Ah, yeah. interesting. Because I, when I, when this pandemic started happening, and I was saying online like global pandemic, I just had this one comment that was just like, if anyone says global pandemic when pandemic means global, I'm gonna scream and yep. then ever since then i've really noticed people say global pandemic even boris johnson our prime minister says global pandemic and i was every time i was like oh that person's gonna be screaming now if you google <laughs> pandemic if you google pandemic one of the, the one of the top definitions yeah. there is either global um, epidemic or an epidemic uh, affecting an entire country yeah it says the whole a whole oh, country I or see. the world yeah so when people say global pandemic they're not saying atm machine they are just specifying that it is a <laughs> pandemic that is affecting the entire world, not one that's just affecting a country. Interesting. Thank yeah. you. So, that's what I was saying. It, it it hit the entire world. Apparently, the president of the United States got it. Uh, you can tell, America. Like, you, I feel like this. Like, the, where I was getting my notes from was written by Americans because, of course, they're going to be like, "Our oh, president Woodrow Wilson, he got it. Like, he got it. Like, wow, the president of the fine. United States, he got it, which means it was really bad. He recovered in three days. <laughs> Miracle." <laughs> Remember Best we all genes that, I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> remember when we all thought that, like, you know, uh, the virus was going to assassinate the president? Do you guys remember that? Twice it happened. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was, like, he looked a little bit weak in some of his uh, in some of his video conferences, and then he actually got it. And yeah. we, both times people were like, well, he's not looking too good. Yeah, it just goes to show you that uh, even though you're, like, a you know, 70-year-old man, having a lot of money means you mm. just don't need to die from That's things crazy. that are killing everyone else. Good Lord. So, you know, we didn't really know what was happening with the, the Spanish flu. Bear in mind, actually, at the time, uh, they they didn't know uh, 
They didn't know that it was a virus that was causing it. Mm. They didn't know what exactly was causing it. Uh, it was called the Spanish flu, uh, but they were looking for bacteria and things because uh, at this point, um, you know, the the flu. I think the, I think the flu was just referring to the, the whole sort of thing. They didn't know that mm. it was caused by viruses. Um, and they didn't have a vaccine to protect against it. Uh, they couldn't use antibiotics because it is a virus and it's not affected by antibiotics. Um, and, uh, they also, and also actually, no, penicillin wasn't even, uh, wasn't even invented yet. Oh, was it? No, I don't it wasn't, it... was it? Penicillin wouldn't do anything. Oh, well, it didn't, wouldn't do anything against a virus. No, but it would do it. it the, if you've got a uh, bacterial infections, um, Coming because you've got a lowered immune system because of the virus. When was penicillin invented? We did an episode on it. Which episode is that? 1928. 1928. So it was a good 10 years off of, uh, uh, it was a good 10 years off of any <laughs> antibiotics existing. Uh, so yeah, the world was not in a very good place to deal with this. And yeah, the, the, what, the way they did it, uh, the way they dealt with it uh, was uh, going to be pretty familiar. It was uh, social isolation, quarantine, uh, good hygiene, and uh, disinfectants, uh, no public gatherings, uh, and masks. But obviously it wasn't applied the same across the world. I feel like mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the current day right now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even joking. I genuinely, reading, all, reading about all this, I'm just like, oh my. It's been a hundred years. Can, <laughs> why, can, why are we not doing... Still relevant. <laughs> yeah, why are we not doing better? We didn't know what was going on at the time. 1918, they didn't know. And this is the sort of key point to this story, is that... Even after the you know the pandemic had ended, they still didn't know exactly mm. what it caused it. They couldn't figure it out. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about who you know figured that one out. His name was Richard E. Shope. <gasps> he was born in 1901. Uh, died in 1966. Uh, he uh, well he he did he did a fair amount in his life. Uh, he got um, uh, an MD from the University of Iowa mm -hmm. in Iowa City. That was in 1924. Uh, and then he joined the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Laboratory um, under Paul Lewis. And uh, that was in uh, that was uh, at Princeton in New Jersey. And he then became the head of his own laboratory in 1929. Um, and then he sort of just, he briefly went elsewhere, but then he came back to the Rockefeller and stayed there for the rest of his career. He also worked for the army during World War II uh, to make a vaccine against uh, a, a disease that was affecting like cows. Um, and he got a lot of awards throughout his life. Um, and apparently he was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences. So to tell you what Shope did, first I need to tell you about a man named Richard Pfeiffer, who uh, was from Germany. He was a scientist, he studied bacteria, and he found what caused the flu. He found the bacterium that caused the flu. He found that strain of bacteria <gasps> that caused it. Um, although you might be a little bit confused because he didn't actually, I am. yeah, he didn't actually find the bacteria that caused it. It's not caused by bacteria. It's not, it's not. So as you can probably tell, Pfeiffer <laughs> had, uh, made a little bit of a boo-boo. Uh, he found, so he, what, but it makes sense. If you, if you follow the story through, it makes sense. He found, uh, this rod shaped bacteria, um, and he got it from the, the nose of people, the noses of people that were infected with, um, the flu and he called it Bacillus influenzae um or pfeiffer's bacillus uh bacillus i think generally i think that means rod shaped oh my god every single time i say something like this i think what if someone like what if a lecturer from my university listens to this and says man you should really <laughs> like you should know this because it does mean that i've checked thanks uh no i i'm pretty sure bacillus uh, is refers to the rod shaped yeah, um, rod shaped bacterium yeah yeah, good. I know this. I just don't feel confident in myself. Well done. Well done. So, Bacillus influenzae, rod-shaped um, influenza, basically. Uh, so he he uh, he was like, you know, he thought like, I found this great. I, mm. I did it. I got it from the nose of people that were infected. How could it be anything else? And a lot of people were like, Yeah, you found it. Good job, my friend. Well done. Little round of applause for you. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they were not correct. They thought they were because they, at that point, they knew that bacteria caused diseases. Um, they knew that it caused cholera and the plague um, and other things. But um, uh, yeah, it, it just was not the case. Obviously, we know now. Uh, and the thing is that it seems it really seemed to be the case because a lot of people and a lot of patients, you were able to find uh, the bacteria. But the key point is that you couldn't find it in all of them. 
Right. So, um, you know, um, some people uh, were kind of being like, I, I don't think this is the case. You can't find it in everyone. So maybe it's not, maybe it's not correct. You know, maybe we should, maybe we should try and look for something else. So there was this man named uh, Peter Olitsky, uh, and he worked with uh, someone called Frederick Gates. They were both at the Rockefeller Institute. Mm -hmm. um, they basically took uh, nasal secretions, mucus, snot, from patients mm -hmm. that uh, were infected with that 1918 flu, and uh, they passed them through uh, filters, very, very fine filters, which get rid of bacteria. Now, um, they, uh, they basically uh, found, uh, they basically, <laughs> once they'd filtered that out, they were able to give rabbits um, lung disease with, um, <laughs> yeah, with what they filtered. They gave rabbits lung disease yeah, so they with fil filtered snot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you, just because you can, doesn't mean that you should. <laughs> yeah, but like, hey, I've filtered this snot and I'm able to give rabbits lung disease. <laughs> Congratulations. Right, okay, no, I feel, like, okay. wow, I feel like you guys are taking this as though, well, we filtered the snot. What do we do with it now? Shall we chuck it? Well, I got no. some rabbits here. Do you want to see if we can get... No. Let's see what it does. <laughs> That's the, that was the entire point of filtering it to see if it was still infectious after it's filtered. Because think about it this way. If you filter out the bacteria and there's no bacteria in it and it's still infectious, then the bacteria can't be what's infecting people. No, right? right? I did get that. I was just teasing you. No, I know you got that, but some people may not, and that's a okay. <laughs> but they did, in fact, get lung disease. <laughs> no, 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 the rabbits did. And then they filtered rabbits, and they were able to give people influenza. Incredible. How does, how does one You filter all the rabbit out, you just got the influenza left. I mean, what, are you just putting rabbits in a vat of water? And like, in, a and in a rabbit filter. It filters out the a, rabbit and just left with the filter. That is a net. What you're talking yeah. about is a net. Yeah, and the rabbit sneezed through the net. No. <laughs> and there's somebody on the other side breathing in, and then they get influenza. I don't even know if rabbits can sneeze. Oh, they can sneeze. Can they? Yeah. Do you know that for a fact? or are you... I had rabbits, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> effectively were... <laughs> rabbits sneeze i did not know that you knew that i did not know that you had rabbits i just thought you were being like of course rabbits can sneeze like, why would they not be able to sneeze <laughs> <laughs> no they can sneeze okay so uh they filtered out the snot they'd given it to uh they'd given it to well, they didn't filter it that's not they'd filtered the snot they'd given the filtered snot to rabbits the rabbits then got lung disease so they had they they had isolated the influenza virus but they uh didn't know um, that they had, uh, they didn't know that's what they found. Mm -hmm. They were actually calling it an atypical bacterium, uh, bacterium uh, pneumosynthase. Uh, but other researchers could not reproduce the results, which is a big, like, is a big, like, sort of red flag in the science mm -hmm. world. If you do something and you say, I found this thing, and then someone else tries to do it and they say, I cannot do the same thing, then you've not really found something. Well, not that you've not really found something, you've not necessarily found something. The big, big big thing about science is it needs to be repeatable and reliable mm -hmm. uh if you make a discovery you need to be damn sure that other people can make discoveries which is why you uh are, it's why you've got a post uh i say post you've got to give your sort of full method so everyone knows exactly how you did it yeah and someone could be like i will follow those same methods and try and get the same results uh so they uh all the and gates they did this in 1918 uh but um richard shope 10 years later Ooh. Ten years later, uh, he was working at the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Institute. That's so hard to say. Rockefeller Institute, uh, the same place uh, that uh, the two men previously were working. Um, and he started looking at swine influenza. Because pig farmers in Iowa, uh, had they'd, they'd had a couple outbreaks. Um, mm -hmm. One in 19, and then another in 1929. Um, and this was like, a, basically a very, very contagious flu um, that was really that was spreading among their pigs. Um, and what, what they did was, uh, Shope and his mentor, Paul, Paul Lewis, they took the mucus and the lung samples from the infected pigs and they tried to isolate the, uh, the thing that was causing the disease. They tried to figure out what it was. Um, and they managed to find a bacterium that looked exactly like, uh, Pfeiffer's bacterium, mm -hmm. the Bacillus influenzae. Uh, and, what when they infected when they tried to infect the pigs with that bacteria they injected it back into healthy pigs it didn't do anything it didn't cause any disease so they were like okay uh, this guy uh, this guy what's his name pfeiffer mm. found found the bacteria that caused the, this flu but it we give it to the pigs and it doesn't cause the flu what's going on should be causing You've the flu you got to give it to a rabbit no come um, on 
<laughs> basic mistake. Look, if you talk one more time about having sex with a rabbit, I swear to God you're off the podcast. What? It's too many times. <laughs> I didn't give it oh, to a rabbit. The many a hours rabbit. a day that Jap has to spend just cutting around you talking about rabbit sex, it is absurd. And then I have and to disgusting. do an, then I have to do an edit where I just put it on loop for five minutes, just so we have it. Just so we've got it. And actually, this is the thing: if you don't do that, Lucas threatens to quit <laughs> yes. many times. He's trapped in this podcast by the threat of all the things we can release. <laughs> <laughs> so tired. <laughs> You look so so tired. <laughs> but seriously, when I when I say you got to give it to a rabbit, <laughs> not that's what I mean not is, the thing is you know, but seriously, they... when I say you've got to give it to a rabbit, like you really well, got to. No. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, why do they assume that giving the bacterium to a pig will have the same effect as these previous people found when giving because it they, to a rabbit? Because they isolated it from pigs. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, I remember they, they took clearly. it from... I mean, I was listening, but I clearly didn't hear that bit. That was... I was too busy looking at this nice picture of a rabbit <laughs> that I found. Look, put the rabbits away. Thanks, online shopping. Okay, sorry. Bookmark and close. It's <gasps> <gasps> one for the white bag. Add to reading list. <laughs> so, as I was saying, uh, before Luke so rudely interrupted about his weird rabbit fetish, um, they isolated <laughs> the bacteria from pigs, but when they tried to reinfect different pigs with the, the same bacteria that they'd isolated um, from them. It, it just I didn't see. work. It didn't infect those pigs. So clearly that bacteria could not be the cause of the flu. It, it, just, it, just, it just plain couldn't. So Shope then filtered the samples, just like all its skin gates did. And he also found that the filtrate had the infectious agent. So once mm. you get rid of the bacteria, there's still something infectious in there. Um, and it caused a really, really contagious influenza-like disease in pigs. Um, it was more mild than the one that was in the naturally infected pigs though. Mm. Um, and when he mixed what he'd filtered with the bacteria that he'd sort of, with the sort of reproduced bacteria, um, you get the severe disease again. So, right. So the bacteria on its own doesn't cause anything. The filtered mucus causes a mild form of the disease, mm. but bacteria and mucus together cause a severe form of the disease. Extra bad. What? Yeah. What do you guys think is happening? So, are you getting the virus from the filtrate, which is making you more susceptible to the bacteria? Correct. Yes. Yes. Well, exactly. So, uh, essentially, they found that uh, the if, what Shope concluded was that the filtered agent caused the infection, which then. Um, facilitated a, like a, another infection from the bacteria. So he published that result, it, th those results in uh, the Journal of Experimental Medicine. And uh, then some British researchers uh, saw those, saw those, um, um, that, that paper and, and like saw his techniques and then isolated the virus from humans. And that sort of proved that that's what caused the Spanish flu, the mm. influenza virus. Um, and, yeah, like that that's how this sort of story story worked. It was a man basically working with pigs that found out that the flu virus was a virus. And actually quite interestingly, you may think that that means that the Spanish flu, the 1918 flu, was a swine flu as in a flu originating from pigs. Mm. But that is not the case. It's actually much more interesting than that. So what is actually the case? Uh what actually happened is it was an avian flu. It came from birds and spread to humans and then could have spread to pigs afterwards is what we think. Um, and, and this is the thing we actually, uh, proved or not proved. We, we have very strong evidence to support, uh, the idea that the pandemic virus of 1918, um, has genes that are from sort of an avian, like, uh, flu strain basically. Um, and the 1918, uh, Spanish flu, the 1918 flu, um, is the common ancestor of both human and um, classical sort of swine H1N1 flu viruses. Mm. So this this flu virus is basically the sort of the the daddy of modern H1N1 flu viruses, which is which was I think swine flu, uh, the swine flu um, epidemic way back in mm. the noughties mm. when we thought that was a, a big deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that would have been uh, that would have been a descendant from of the Spanish flu then, according to this. But yeah, uh, we've, we we took a long time. We took 10 years to figure out that it wasn't bacteria causing it, that it was uh, a virus causing it. Um, but we we did it, thanks to this man working with pigs and some wow. other men um, in, infecting rabbits with, with lung disease. 
So what was the bacteria then in that situation? Bacteria. Because what you would, I, 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 unless I'm mistaken, what it sounds like you're saying is that the thing that we'd call the Spanish flu, i.e. this really bad thing, um, this really bad infection that, that kills people, if, if, if the virus just gives you a sort of mild infection and then it's sort of a double whammy with your immune system is compromised by the, by the, um, the introduction of the virus and then that leaves mm -hmm. you susceptible to bacterial infection, um, then surely then you could make an argument that the thing that we call on our level of reality, the Spanish flu, um, is actually a combined effort between the, in, the initial um, sort of uh, weakening of your system by the virus and then the knock-on effect coming from a bacterial infection. I mean, that is a very astute observation based on the evidence that I've got in front of me and what, I've, and, and, uh, what I was looking into. Again, bear in mind, not on a Spanish flu episode. Um, yeah, I don't know if, it's, if the virus alone um, is, is incredibly weak. I know that mm. in pigs, it was a much milder form. Mm. Um, in humans, that may or may not be the case. But it was, it's definitely exacerbated by that bacterium. Mm. But then Do you know what that bacterium is? Yeah, uh, I, we named it earlier. It is uh, Bacillus uh, influenza. Ah, it is the same one. Yeah, it's the same right, one. Okay. It's the yeah, same yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is the thing. It could be that, but then uh, ultimately, bear in mind, people were dying from other complications. So it could be the weakened mm. immune system that's uh, leading to any kind of other other infection. Um, but it could be the fact that uh, the I mean this is just just this is just a hypothesis that the bacillus influenzae uh, spreads in a similar manner to um, the flu. So that if mm. someone is infected with the flu um, and then becomes infected with that bacterium, they can spread it spread them both at the same time, and it's kind yeah. of like a perfect storm, kind mm -hmm. of as you said. But yeah, I mean that that you you could be right that the Spanish flu is really a sort of a tag team. Well, all I mean is that the, if we when we are describing the Spanish flu. Now you can obviously say, you, you, it depends what you're specifying. If when you're saying the Spanish flu, you mean that specific virus, then obviously the Spanish flu is that specific virus. But when you say the Spanish flu, i.e. Um, the set of illnesses that swept different countries and caused lots of people to die, um, then that could, like you say, could well, be a tag team. Remember, it depends what you're specifically um, talking about. Do you remember what we, how we were talking about um, how deaths are listed before? Mm -hmm. that there's the sort of primary cause and then yes. the sort of subsequent or subsequent causes. In in this case, uh, it seems that the influenza virus, sort of 1918 pandemic Spanish flu virus, would be mm. the main cause. And then the bacterial infection that follows, um, that is facilitated by that uh, viral infection, would be sort of t uh, sort of uh, subsequent yeah. causes. But you couldn't. The person would not have. The person would not have died from that no. bacterial infection. Had they not had the flu, no, as well. Do you, know, so, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's one of the it's it's one of those things. Uh, but although, to be fair, back then as well, it is quite difficult because they weren't necessarily recording all flu deaths as flu deaths. Yeah, not because they yeah. were malicious or anything, just because it, things were not necessarily as uh, well uh, sort of well structured as we as they are now. It's just so that sort of line of of, of conversation and inquiry is so fascinating to me, and we've talked about it before on the podcast where you have like technically the cause of death is like diarrhea or like dehydration or like whatever causes mm. of death you can have or pneumonia or lots of other things but you wouldn't have got those things had you not got the original virus that's just another level of sort of um clarity and of understanding of how we come to die from the introduction of these things it's like the the virus is this key that opens up all this other scattering things that happen to you and the way that your body fails. Mm. Um, well, it's like, but the way we would colloquial talk, colloquially talk about it is you die of the virus. Yeah. Well, or it's the like, virus causes death. You die of cancer, but do you do you die of cancer? Or do you die of complications no. due to cancer? Like yeah. organ yeah. failure. Yeah. 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 Do you die of old age? What is no. what is old age? Like, how does, how does one die of old age? You're... I guess, I mean, the way that you could, the way that you could die of old age and nothing else, I suppose, is just your body not working properly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But even then, there would still be potentially a heart attack caused by yeah. something or, you, you know what I mean? It, mm. The way we talk about things is, it's interesting because it really, it, it really affects the way that we sort of conceptualize things. And mm -hmm. that, that sounds like a really sort of basic thought, but... I don't think we necessarily consider enough how much language affects our perception of the world. Mm. Because yeah. 
I mean, even things like, even when it comes to things like, uh, you know, the difference between sort of illnesses and symptoms, like how we think of diarrhea as an illness. Oh, I've got diarrhea, but actually that's just a symptom, you know, in the same yeah. way that we think of the cold as, oh, it's caused by one thing. The cold is caused by a number of different viruses mm -hmm. and the flu is caused by a number of different flu viruses. They, we, we link the flu together because, um, it's, it's, it's different stray. It's sort of similar strains, um, of viruses. They're all from the same sort of family, but when it comes to the common cold, it's just, it's just a bunch of different viruses that cause the cold, that cause the same symptoms. Mm. It, it's just interesting that, uh, especially when it comes to medicine, that uh, we we really, really are, really are limited by um, the way that our language describes it. My favorite example of that, <laughs> which I always come back to, it always gets reminded of me in, in, in like daily life, is that we have uh, in our English language, which doesn't occur in every language, we have a very accusational language. So the way mm -hmm. that we say something like, um, if James were to knock a cup off of the table, we'd say, James broke a cup. Even though James, th that's the same thing we'd say as if James deliberately broke a cup. Mm -hmm. And we don't specify, um, unless we deliberately make an effort to, we don't make a, spe like, like one thing other languages might say is, the cup was broken. The, the passive cup got voice. broken. Yeah, passive. And we don't, we don't have that and it's not we, normal in our language well, we to specify passive, yeah. yeah but we don't it's not normal in our language to specify um, accidental things as separate to deliberate things there's oh, i want to do I, I it may not be science i don't know i don't care if it's science or not i want to do an episode on linguistics and language and like i want to do a whole series on it because oh, it's so people request in, that yeah so many people yeah. it's so interesting it's so interesting like how some languages um like uh, if you if, about when you talk about colors okay uh, this is what I think is really interesting. We sort of think of colors as being separate, you know, as very distinct things when actually, well, not all that distinct, but mm. even when you consider the fact that um, in the most basic languages, I think the only colors that they've got, like the, the most limited number of colors you can have, I think is red, blue, and maybe green. I'm not sure. Or red and blue. I think the least number of colors you can have is three in a language. Those are the least mm. that we found. But uh, like you get additional colors in additional languages. So for example, not all languages have a word for pink. Um, but mm. when your language has a word for pink, which is just light red, yeah. um, you then visually dis you visually separate pink from light pink in, in, the same, in the same sense that you see blue and you think that's blue. But other languages have a distinct word for light blue. So they will see light blue and mm. blue as different colors. Yeah. And some languages don't discern uh, green from blue they say say those are the same color. So you'll say, oh, it's the, the, like, oh, the, the sky is green and so is the, the sky is blue and so are the trees. Yeah. Sort of thing, you know? It's just really interesting to me that uh, even even something that seems as fundamental as color is f fully influenced by the way that your language describes it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify there, um, there are languages with two terms, which are just um, dark and bright. And languages that have three terms are black white and red ah uh, there we go good thank so you very red much being, i want red i guess is is important because it, it denotes danger in terms of um like things that aren't edible and things that might be poisonous quite a lot and blood time. well i mean but yeah, yeah it makes you wonder if they actually they actually live in a world like um subjectively where they don't actually see like they don't well, see the same colors as we see them. We just they just see light, dark, and red. Well, okay, think about it. I don't. I, okay, so I don't think you don't see the colors. It's more. Okay, do you know how there were sort of two distinct shades of sort of teal? You've got like the more sort of teal being a sort of greeny blue. Mm. So you've mm. got kind of greeny blue and a sort of bluey green, and there's no distinct point where mm. you can discern greeny blue from bluey green. But like when you compare them together, you're like. Well, I guess that's greeny blue and that's bluey green. Yeah. <laughs> but we but only but, relative to each other. Yeah, relative yeah. to But we don't have a word for sort of greeny blue. So we don't just see that and think, oh, it's greeny blue. We just we just think that it's like, oh, that's blue. Green or blue. Or that's, or that's yeah. green. In the same sense, if a language doesn't have a word for sort of blue or uh, they don't have a distinct word for blue or green, they won't see them as the same color. You can obviously discern that they are different shades, mm -hmm. but you'd be like, oh, they're different shades of the same color. In the same way that we see blue and think, uh, light blue is baby blue is just a different shade of blue than dark blue. Yeah. But we see pink and red and we're like, those are, that pink is not red. It is not. Despite the fact that pink is as red as light blue is blue. <laughs> light red. 
like red. Yeah. Oh my God, that was <laughs> whew, that was so much. That was a lot to <laughs> wrap my head around. But no, it's interesting. Um, if you, I, I would genuinely recommend looking into sort of how languages describe things because it really affects, yeah. uh, really affects a lot. Weird that we got onto that uh, talking about the Spanish flu, but um, actually it's not that weird because the Spanish flu we describe it as the Spanish flu, despite the fact that it wasn't from Spain. So even these sort of um, these sort of things in language, we can uh, we can you know they affect uh, medicine, pandemics, the way we view mm -hmm. everything. Um, the Spanish flu isn't the Spanish flu, and the coronavirus Damn. isn't the China virus. No. So you know, uh, I just think that's interesting. But what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was talking to you, but I wasn't. Anything else you guys want to say? Uh, try not to get Sad. the Spanish flow, if possible. I mean, it'd be pretty difficult. Yeah. You'd, you'd have or to, you'd challenge, have to, try and get it. You'd have to go out. In fact, <laughs> I 100% I believe that it would be infinitely harder to mm. get the Spanish flu than it would be to not get it. You'd really have to go out your way. You'd have to spend mm. years working your way up to be like, uh, a, a fairly actually it would, would you have to spend that long you just need to get yourself into a lab where you're able to yeah. work with the Spanish flu Luke what, what do you want people to do I want them to once they've got the Spanish flu I want them to snot in a filter and feed that to a rabbit Well, thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and now TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. I am not Corey everywhere. I'm Champion everywhere. I'm Luke Cuppold everywhere. Goodbye. 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 <laughs>